This is Dr. K's discipline is actually an emotion. And apparently he says some stuff that I normally say. And though I watch Dr. K, like every like 10 or 15 videos, I'll, I'll catch a Dr. K video. Um, I don't know everything about Dr. K, but I know some pretty good things. And I'm not surprised that some of him, my work and his work do overlap since he's on the philosophy train of like self-improvement as well as therapy, which are two different things. They just tend to overlap sometimes. So let's go ahead and give this a listen together. We're going to talk about how to use emotion to cultivate discipline. And this is really important because when it comes to discipline, we all know we need it, but we don't really know how to get more of it. I remember when I was growing up, my mom would always get on my case for being undisciplined. You're always going to sleep too late. You are waking up too late. You're not doing your things on time. Alok, you need more discipline. And I was like, all right, I hear you. I sort of get that I should be waking up every day on time. I should be eating healthy, exercising, studying, all that good stuff. I'm game. How do I become more disciplined? And then she's like, well, you need to wake up every day at the same time. Then you will be disciplined. And I got kind of confused because I was like, wait a second, don't I need discipline first to wake up every day at the same time? If you're ready to take the next step on your mental health journey, check out Dr. K's guide. It's an immersive resource that distills over 20 years of my experience. Now, I'm not sure, again, this part of Dr. K's work, I'm not sure what he's offering. I'm not sure if it's great. I'm not sure if he's a good therapist, but I do enjoy his content. Experience laid out in a way that is tailored to your needs. So if you're ready to better understand your mind and take control of it, check out the link in the description below. And so if we sort of think about discipline, part of the reason it's so hard to cultivate is because we don't really understand what it is. We think of discipline as the exertion of willpower, but you can exert willpower for a day or maybe two, but over time, at some point, you're gonna start failing, right? You can that's why, I don't know what he's about to say, but that's why I think discipline coincides with the why, the philosophy you have around existing and existence. So I don't know if that's what he's going to say, but I do feel like that's why discipline fails because willpower is great. Sometimes I will power through my day, absolutely. But without a doubt, the willpower, it's a cope, right? The best part, the the reason I maintain discipline is because it coincides with my philosophy in relation to my joy and it helps me maintain that joy. I want to be joyful. I want to be healthy, happy, and kind. And in order to do that, I have to be disciplined. I cannot give in to temptation no matter how good it looks because it's never going to be great once I've gotten it. Like, you know how people always say, um, for a million dollars, would you do X, Y, Z? If it betrays my values, absolutely not. It is better for me to make money slowly over time than to sell my soul against my values to do it because I just know it's not gonna end up well. I just know it's not gonna coincide with my joy. I would rather be joyful. I work too hard to be this joyful, to give it up for something like money, a construct like money. No, girl, absolutely not. Ooh, I would love, absolutely love to see a Brit Dr. K interview. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. I'm a little nervous about him asking me personal questions about my life because even though I'm pretty transparent, sometimes I feel like his work is really intimate and I'm um, a little hesitant, though it'd be interesting since no one, not a lot of people really deep dive into my life like in the same way. A lot of people ask me questions to debunk my ideas. But not a lot of people who interview me are interested in my literal humanity of how I was raised. I think they wouldn't be able to handle it, if I'm being honest. I think Dr. K would probably be able to handle it pretty well, actually, because I would be honest about how it impacted me. But most people on the internet just want to know about your childhood so they can debunk your ideas. Um, but I have a feeling he'd probably honestly make me cry because we'd actually talk about real stuff. <laughs> can wake up every day or you can wake up at 7 a.m. the first day, the second day, the third day. You can make a New Year's resolution where you're like, I'm going to eat healthy. And you exert willpower for a time and eventually willpower runs out. And this is why everyone's so focused on habits, right? Because, okay, if you can build a habit, it's all about building habits, then I don't need willpower. But a habit is about automatic behavior. It's about sort of being reflexive. But what about discipline? What about these people who are like focused over time and can cultivate this discipline? And it turns out that the reason it's so hard to cultivate is because we don't understand what it is. Discipline is actually an emotion. Now, that may sound really confusing because we don't think about discipline as an emotion. But this is something that I sort of figured out when I was working as, as an addiction psychiatrist. I was working with all these people who were addicted to substances, stuff like heroin and cocaine and Adderall and alcohol, marijuana. And I really was trying to figure out, like, okay, how do we help this person? How can I help this person overcome this addiction? 
And we sort of teach meditation, right? We teach mindfulness. We teach them how to sort of increase their willpower and resist impulses. But I got kind of fundamentally confused because what an addict needs is discipline. But if you look at the science of psychotherapy, what are we talking about with addicts all the time? We're not sending them to boot camp to sort of train really hard and become disciplined. We're talking to them about their feelings. So how does that work? How is it that, because if you think about overcoming an addiction, someone needs a lot of discipline to overcome an addiction. And yet at the same time, when we sort of think a little bit about, okay, how do you help someone become sober? You're doing emotional work. And the answer is actually pretty surprising. That common neuroscience has actually led us astray and we don't really understand what emotion is. So what's happened in neuroscience is we've figured out that there are emotional structures in the brain. And it's kind of common knowledge now that if you look at things like the amygdala and limbic system, you have these centers of the brain, these anatomical structures where emotion exists, like fear and anxiety and things like that. We have all these brain scans that show that these are the emotional centers of the brain. But this is actually a huge misconception. So we have a anxiety center, and that's absolutely in the amygdala. We have a fear center, and that's absolutely in the amygdala. But what about the positive emotions? Where is the humor center of the brain? Where is the joy center of the brain? Where is the love center of the brain? And this is where we really have to get out into the specifics of the neuroscience, but we've actually all been led astray because negative emotions are localized to anatomical structures. But as we move into the positive emotions, people are kind of confused about where they are, right? You can go to a psychotherapist and they can teach you how to be less anxious. We're really good at working on that. But can you go to a psychotherapist to be more funny? Can you go to a psychotherapist to actually learn joy? And that's not where we actually go, right? Ooh, can you go to learn joy? I really do think like mental health is mental health and philosophy is joy. I don't think, and I don't know what he's going to say, but I don't think you go to a therapist to learn about the consciousness in relation to joy. I think you go to a therapist to repair the holes in the consciousness that's related to your mental health. Like you go to a doctor, an MD, to help you help the body, but you don't go to your doctor and say, now make me joyful because you healed my leg. But we associate mental health, psychiatry, or like psychology, therapy, whatever, we associate it with that existential dread in relation to the consciousness. It's why so many people go to therapy and they're still a mess because therapy was one of the five things you needed to do to be a whole human being. To be a whole human being, mental health is only one part. Then there's the philosophy and that's the second part. And you don't have to do them in order. Sometimes you can do them at the same time, but that's, you know what I mean? I don't know what he's going to say. Let's find out. But I, I have, that's what I would say. Right? And where are the traditions that we sort of find this knowledge? It's actually in yoga and meditation in places like Zen Buddhism. So Let's if go. you look at sort of the what Zen Buddhists are really good at, they're really great at understanding humor. They actually use humor as a path to enlightenment. And I'd love to share with you all a story that kind of exemplifies this. Mm -hmm. So when I was studying in the ashram, I had a teacher who sort of told me the story that was brilliant. So there was a master who was teaching people to meditate, and he had a lot of disciples. So they would wake up every morning at 4.30 in the morning, and they'd go to the meditation hall to meditate. The problem is, as the monks were sitting there trying to meditate, there was a cat that lived in the ashram or the monastery. And the cat would get pretty excited because now everyone's awake and everyone's kind of sitting down and trying to meditate. And the cat starts messing with people, right? It gets excited. It starts walking on one monk, Cute. starts walking on another monk, just interferes with their meditation. And so the master looks at this and realizes, okay, this cat is interfering with everyone's meditation. So he tells his, his disciples, he says, okay, when the cat shows up, the first thing we need to do is put a bucket on top of the cat for like 45 minutes while we meditate. Then we're going to lift the bucket and then the cat can do whatever it wants. So the, the, the monks start doing this. The disciples start doing this. They put a cat under the bucket and then everyone's able to meditate. So over time, the master teaches this lesson and says, okay, before we start to meditate, the most important thing to do is to put the bucket on the cat. And everyone's like, okay, master, we got it. And if anyone screwed up and forgot to put the bucket on the cat, the cat would interfere with everyone's meditation. So the master taught this principle to one disciple after another, after another. Make sure before you start to meditate, you put a bucket on the cat. So then the master dies. And everyone's like, okay, that's, you know, that's okay. We're going to mourn the master, but the master taught all this stuff. So we're going to continue doing it. And so they continue to get up every day. They continue to put the bucket on the cat. 
And then one day something weird happens. A couple of years later, the cat dies. And now suddenly all the monks are in a panic. They're like, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? There's no, there's no, we can't put the bucket on the cat. And the master taught us the first thing you should do anytime you meditate is put the bucket on the cat. What do we do? And someone else was like, I know, let's go find a new cat. And that's exactly what they did. So this is what I love about the tradition of meditation. When it comes to sort of the cultivation of positive emotions, how do we find joy? How do we find humor? This is where the yogis and Zen masters really figured something out. And when I was struggling as an addiction psychiatrist to try to figure out how can I help my patients be more disciplined, I actually went to an ancient yogic text. It's one of the Upanishads. Sorry, before he continues, I just want to, I'm looking at your comments and I want to say, um, Someone said philosophy is how you reach joy, I would say. I would say that philosophy in conjunction with mental health, in conjunction to physical health, in conjunction with financial health, in conjunction to who you are in the story is how you reach joy. I would argue that you need to be a whole human being in order to have a relationship with joy, meaning you need to have a whole relationship with your consciousness. I think the reason people feel out of sync with themselves is because they don't have the same relationship with their consciousness that they think they do. They're still figuring it out. If you feel like you don't know what to do next, that you're at odds, that nothing's making sense, there's no consistency, that you're constantly in battling, like um, you're a battle with yourself, you're talking about, I think, a lack of joy. Like this last few months, I've been so stressed with immigration and everything. You guys have seen it. But I never lost my sense of joy. I never got depressed again. I never self-harmed. I never um, thought to myself, like, oh, I'm going to go back to my suicidal ideations. I never went to a place that was really dark. I just acknowledged that I was stressed and I was allowed to be stressed and that I would eventually not feel this stress because, like, I'm still a human. I still feel emotions. And I would say that is because I went from not knowing myself to knowing myself enough that when my brain panics, when I have intrusive thoughts, because I still suffer from intrusive thoughts, of course, when those things happen, I know what is an intrusive thought and what's me, what's actually what I want. Because again, I don't think you're your intrusive thoughts. I think intrusive thoughts are not real. Like they're real because they're happening, but they're not you. So a lot of people who think like, oh, your intrusive thoughts, your most honest thought are probably the same kind of people who think you're most honest when you're drunk, which is just not true for so many people. So many studies have been done about like the deception of being impaired, right? If being impaired was your honest self, then why do we say that if people are impaired, they're like, you can't have sex with them? Because if that's their honest self, your drunk self often wants to have unprotected sex with people. Is that not your true self? No, because you're impaired. So we don't want, we want to give you an opportunity to be sober before making a decision. You have to be sober to take care of children, right? You wouldn't go to work drunk. You have to be sober to handle machinery in a construction site. You can't be drunk. Being impaired is a problem. It is not your true self. It is an inebriated, it is a faulty self, much like being mentally ill, right? So I don't think philosophy is literally the key to joy. I think all these things in conjunction, like a cake isn't just one thing. It's a conglomerate of a bunch of things to make the cake. Same thing. You have to gather a lot of the things together to be the whole human being to find your joy. And again, when you talk about my level system for introspection, one through five, I think you can be a joyful two and a joyful five. I think these are two different journeys. I do not think you need to be a five to be joyful. Girl, please, that is just a different specific journey. You can be anybody you want to be as long as you have a real sense of self and understanding of what, why, who, and all that, all the good stuff. You know what I'm saying? Um... <laughs> I used to describe my intrusive thoughts as not belonging to me. Thoughts in my head, but they aren't mine. Yeah, it feels like a like a voice where you're like, oh, that's crazy. I just had that thought. But it's like, it's not even me. It's like, I don't even think that. It's, oh, it's so amazing. Um, it's so amazing how that works. Okay, let's keep going. That sort of blew my mind as I tried to understand where in the mind discipline comes from. So I'm going to share with that with y'all now. So let's start with one basic observation that the yogis made. The first observation that they made is that opposites are in the same category, right? So we can say that red and blue, let's say, are opposite colors, but they're both colors. Hot and cold are both within the same category of temperature. Heavy and light are in the same category of weight. And so then the, when they looked at discipline, they tried to figure out, okay, what is it that causes a lack of discipline? And what they concluded is that doubt or a wavering mind is the opposite of discipline. And so doubt or a wavering mind is the opposite of discipline. 
oh my God, so true, so true. The last few months when I was dealing with all my stress, my doubt coincided completely with my discipline. Apps, this is so true for me. This is so true for me. The moment I wavered on um, like my discipline with getting my sleep, that was the one thing I lacked in discipline. Oh my God. I was getting like five hours of sleep a night when I need eight to nine. And I was getting five. And you saw, oh, I saw how it impacted my life. Like without a doubt, I 100% relate. They kind of looked at people and they said, okay, what <sighs> is it? Why is it that someone stops being disciplined? Well, what, they doubt, right? So if, if I think about a marriage where I'm starting to like be oh. uncommitted to my partner, I'm not oh. disciplined in terms of the marriage. Oh. What's at the root of that? It's doubt. I don't know if this person oh. is right for me. Oh. I know that maybe like I felt this and maybe you'll feel this too, where if you sort of think about what causes, what keeps you from being disciplined with studies, right? So if you're, if you kind of think about it, like maybe you chose to major in like engineering or stump, some STEM field and you want to be super disciplined about it, but you're not really sure that you like it. You're not really sure if it's right for you. So you wake up every day and you try really hard and you kind of end up getting B's and A's and maybe an occasional C, but you just don't have that fire or that discipline to really work the way that you need to. And why is that? It's because in the back of your mind, you're not sure. You're not sure that this is what you want to do. You're not sure that this mm -hmm. is the right thing. And so the doubt gets in the way of discipline. The next thing that the yogi sort of discovered is that, okay, if doubt gets in the way of discipline, what is the opposite of doubt? And they used a slightly different word. I, this is all in Sanskrit, but they translated that not as discipline, but as resolve. So what is the mm. opposite of doubt? Well, the opposite is resolve. And as mm. I started to look at that, I kind of stumbled into this thing that really helped me help my patients a lot, which is that I don't need to cultivate discipline. What I really need to do is cultivate resolve. Because mm. when someone is resolved internally, mm. then what they end up behaving like is disciplined. Right. Yes. So when I wake up, at, let's say on New Year's yes. Day and I have a New Year's resolution and it's even baked into the language. What is that New Year's resolution? It is a resolve. The problem is that we are never taught how to cultivate resolve. Right. Mm. We make them all the time. But so, OK, so before he gives his answer, I would say what I'm trying to say is resolve is the why of your values. I would say your values give you the resolve. That's what I would say. I would say your values and knowing your consciousness and then why you want to keep those values is a part of the resolve. It's what keeps you disciplined when temptation comes knocking at your door because temptation will always come knocking at your door. So why do you make the decisions when temptation, why not engage? Why not cheat on your partner? Why not hit your kid in a violent manner? Why not spend all your money? Why not just give up on living? Why not do anything? You have to know why. Everything is about the why, the philosophy and relation you have with your values. That is what I would say. What's what's he going to say? But then we don't keep it going. And that, too, is consistent with emotion, because if we look at which parts of our body change or which parts of our brain change, habits are pretty fixed. Our willpower even is sort of a battery that has a certain amount of energy in it. True. But what is it that fluctuates on a day to day basis in the mind the most? It is actually emotions. If you're angry today, you won't necessarily be angry tomorrow. Falling in love today doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be in love 10 years from now. Mm. So what resolve really is, is actually an emotion. And if you've been resolved at some point in your life, you know what I mean. When you kind of think about those moments where you get resolved, right? You're mm. like, I'm going to pass this class or I'm going to be mm. at the top of my class or I'm going to get a 4.0 or I'm done with this person. I am never texting this person again. Mm -hmm. I'm never playing another game of League of Legends or I'm never playing another <laughs> game of Dota. I'm done with video games. What is that? Right. That's yeah. a resolve. It's actually mm. an emotional kind of thing. And this is what's really interesting is once I sort of stumbled on this through yoga, I started to wonder, well, hold on a second. Is P.S. We have yoga coming up on the discord. If you guys want to join, I pay a professional to teach us yoga once a month. And she is amazing. It's a 30 minute class. It's very easy, especially if you have fibro like I do. It's it's really, really considerate of people and their unique um, ailments, should I say. So it's really, really good. Um, it's on the 17th of September and it's at 2 p.m. Eastern. That's 11 a.m. Pacific and that's 8 p.m. CEST. So if you guys are interested, I have a professional coming in every month, once a month, who teaches us yoga. 
and it's really, really good. Resolve actually an emotion. And I went back to actually more recent and sophisticated neuroscience where it's kind of shocking, but if we sort of look at this together, if we look at this table, what we'll see is core and extended emotional brain circuitry components. And if y'all are amateur neuroscientists, you know that the amygdala in the limbic system are where we sort of think about where emotions exist. But if you look at all this, this is complicated, right? This is parts of our frontal lobes. This what is parts of like our anterior cingulate cortex. It's a and if we vibe, look though. at these emotional circuits in the brain, what you sort of discover is that a lot of positive emotion actually comes from circuits, not anatomical structures. So this is where we have to get a little bit technical. But one of the things that we, a lot of people kind of don't get is that functions in the brain can come from two places. They can sometimes come from an anatomical structure, like an amygdala, that is kind of like surrounded. It's a chunk of tissue that emotion comes from. But the other place that's, uh, that, that like stuff can come from in the brain isn't a, a structure. It's actually a circuit. It's a series of connections from different parts of the brain. And the really interesting thing is that positive emotions come from circuits. So if we look at something like love, there is not a love center in the brain. There is not a part of the brain where if you get a stroke or you get some kind of problem, you will never be able to love again. I mean, there may be multiple areas that you can get strokes that will sort of interfere with love. But there are some of these more positive emotions that come from the harmony or the, the communication between different parts of the brain. And resolve is absolutely one of those things. So if we okay. look at the brain of someone who is resolved, there's stuff going on in the frontal lobes. There's stuff going on in the limbic system. There's stuff going on in places like the anterior cingulate cortex. And so this is where neuroscience kind of falls short because we're not really good at sort of activating those circuits. And if you want to cultivate discipline, what you actually need to do is not cultivate willpower. That's a different function in the brain. Not cultivate habit, but actually cultivate resolve on a daily basis. Let's go. And the cool thing is just like the Zen masters figured out where the nature of humor is, and they sort of tell all these hilarious stories. They were the original comedians. We can actually turn to yoga to teach us how to cultivate resolve. So the first thing that I'm going to tell you all to do okay. is notice when you feel resolved. Right? So the next time that you feel resolved, just take a snapshot of it. Close your eyes and try to sort of notice what is the experience of resolve. And what you'll discover is that resolve fuels your willpower. Right? When you get resolved in something and then you start to do it, the doubts... It's true. When I'm, when I'm activating my willpower, it's because... I'm doing or accomplishing a goal that coincides with my values. So he hasn't used the word values or morals or anything like that yet. So that's how my brain would process this information, right? I'm still going to go back to how my brain would process this. I would say that my discipline comes from my values. My values is related to my resolve. And then I stay consistent with those values through temptation because that's the, that's who Brittany is in her best self. Um, when I'm feeling, you know, out of spoons, I use my willpower that's based off of my need to get this done goals to get me through a moment it's not it's a cope though I think like willpower is sometimes like a cope because it means you're out of spoons you have to use your will you have to like invoke willpower to get it done even when you're at your you know the end of your rope and so I do think that I want to avoid having to evoke that by being more efficient with my spoons but in general like I would say this all coincides with value still the why of what I'm doing which again, when I was interviewing, <laughs> interrogating, if you will, my now husband, so much of that conversation was around our values. Like what can I depend on him for? What does his resolve look like? What are the things I know he's committed to doing? And what are the things we both are working on? What are the hopes we have for one another? Um, I mean, like I've said, him and I are both neurodivergents. We both have a tendency to like lose our spoons very quickly. And we both have very limited uh, ways that we can function throughout the day. So we have to pick and choose. So we have to pick and choose based off of like priorities. Like, so for him and I to have a successful relationship, we, we figure out what are the priorities for the day. So like we wake up every day, we check in the night before, then we check in again when we wake up. Cause you know, sometimes my fibro acts up and my body's worse the next day. Sometimes like our brains aren't as like ready to take on the day. So we check in in the mornings and we say, okay, what does our day look like? And then we kind of check in in the middle of the day and we check in a few times because again, we have to do certain things we've decided to do, but all the other stuff that we put on the list, well, those things can get done if we can focus on the priority. The priority is always about the success of the relationship, especially long-term, right? Even if you're just got enough spoons to talk about today, 
to be disciplined and have resolve for today, if you can do it today, it's going to impact tomorrow. And that's something. That's really important, right? I know it sounds like, oh, no, I'm just thinking about what I can do today. But trust me, what you do today will impact tomorrow. So good job for doing just today because just today is also about tomorrow and other kind of ideas and distractions will pop into your head. But there's this like, there's this thermonuclear engine within you that is fueling that willpower. So you're able to say, no, 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 I'm resolved. No games today. No distractions today. I'm focused. I'm resolved. It's actually emotional. So the first step is to actually notice what it is. The second thing that we're going to talk about is something called a sankalpa, which is something that literally translates to resolve. But what yogis actually figured out is that there is a practice to develop a sankalpa. And we're going to talk about that now. So what I, I strongly recommend that y'all do is pick one thing that you want to be resolved towards. And there are kind of two versions that we're going to do. One is sort of a very specific thing and one is kind of a broad thing. So you can pick any kind of resolve. So I, for example, gave up ice cream for a decade. And this was part of my yogic practice that my, my teacher was teaching me how to develop resolve. So I didn't pick something that was hard. I picked something that was like relatively easy. It was like kind of like medium difficulty because you don't want to if someone's learning how to swim, you don't want to dump them in the ocean. You want to start them in the kiddie pool. So the first mistake that we oftentimes make when sort of trying to become disciplined is we pick something that's really, really important to mm. us. The problem is that the things that are really, really important to us usually are hard. And that's why it's important to us, right? Because we haven't been able to do it. They have mm -hmm. a lot of emotional energy. So we're not practicing. We're going right up on stage and performing. So I gave up ice cream for a period of about 10 years. So you can pick one thing Whoa. that I would say is kind of medium difficulty. Wow. And ideally every day, which I know is going to be hard, but what you can hopefully do is every day when you wake up somewhere within the first hour, or hour and a half of your day, close your eyes, sit down somewhere and just think about that resolve, right? So s try to kind of stoke up that fire of resolve within you. And okay, this is going to be the thing that like, you know, this is what I'm focused on. I'm, I'm going to give up ice cream. That's what I did. So I, I think you, it's fine to pick some kind of food or something that's not like too hard to resist, right? Because we don't want to rely on a ton of willpower for our success. We want to focus on the consistency of the resolve and spend about five to 10 minutes in the morning just focusing on that resolve and try to feel whatever that internal emotional state is that you kind of took a snapshot of in step one. Try to feel that coming up again. Let, let yourself kind of open yourself to it. Hard to describe. You know, it's kind of weird. Like you just have to practice and you'll figure out what I mean. And Sorry, I'm gonna, of in I step one, that. try to feel that coming up again. Let, let yourself kind of open yourself to it. Hard to describe. About five to 10 minutes in the morning just focusing on that resolve and try to feel mm. whatever that internal emotional state is that you kind of okay. took a snapshot of in step yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Try to feel that. Actually, I do this. So mine would be like working out. So like you can see a little bit of progress, maybe, maybe not. But I'd love to like actually be disciplined enough to like have like a real like a, a continued gains like okay so I actually do think about working out first and foremost before I decide that I'm gonna have the spoons to do it I think about it and I imagine it and I have a relationship with that image of myself and then I start to feel motivated around it and I start to feel like oh yeah I'm gonna lift some weights bris and I start to feel myself and I start to get excited but it always starts with me thinking about it so I think that's what he's saying because I have to do that. I have to literally wake up in the morning and be like, I'm going to work out. This is what I'm going to do. This is what the exercise I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to feel doing it. These are the clothes I'm going to wear. Like I start to imagine myself to give myself enough room to remember to like save spoons for it and then to get excited about it because I start to get excited when I think about gains and I'm like, okay. I got this. Like, it's like this internal, like, excitement of like, I'm going to do this. So I think that's what he's saying. And that's what I do. Coming up again, let, let yourself kind of open yourself to it. Hard to describe. You know, it's kind of weird. Like, you just have to practice and you'll figure out what I mean. And sort of start to stoke that resolve. Okay, so like no ice cream today. I can do this. I feel good about it. You know, like this is going to help me in, in my long term goal. So sort of think through that resolve and just give that resolve a calm space in your mind. That will cause the resolve to kind of grow. The second kind of resolve that you can do is something that's a little bit more global and something that's a little bit more emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. So if there is something that is really is important to you in life, I would say sit down and spend a little bit longer. This usually takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes and think about that resolve. 
So one example of resolve that I've used with a patient is I deserve to be whole. It's not that I am whole. It's not that I will be whole. It's that I deserve to be whole. And it can take some time to try to figure out what's the right resolve for you. You know, really think about like what you can resonate with that is something that you want to move towards Mm. and resolve that towards yourself. Develop Mm. that sankalpa. And for about 10 to 20 minutes, as many days as you can manage, start with just today, try to do tomorrow, try to do the next day. Think about that resolve and let those emotions come up. We want to cultivate those emotions kind of like a fire. And if you mm. practice these three steps, the first is take a snapshot of it. The second is you can start with something small that is not actually that emotionally engaging so that you can practice fanning the flames. And the third thing is to pick a resolve that is more important. I'd say you can move on to step three after about 30 days mm. of step two. Then you want to start cultivating that emotion on a daily basis. And the cool thing about that is that as we cultivate, literally sit down and for 20 minutes, cultivate that positive emotion through that girls let me translate this into fun get a journal and journal about all the things you want to do get that dopamine hit of thinking about it and then go and do the thing and get the extra actual dopamine hit like get that dopamine right think about it get a journal get a pinterest like um what's it called a uh, not a mood board but a uh, uh what's the thing like a oh, help me what's the term you're gonna put together you're you're like you know, what you hope for. You're going to think about the thing you're going to work on, right? Make it exciting. Get excited. You have so much control in your life. You're about to have, like, you're about to make a choice that you want, that you maybe even need. You're going to actually put an effort. You know, I had this really weird, did I tell you guys, I had the weirdest intrusive thought when I was really stressed the last couple months? The weirdest intrusive thought. Did I tell you guys this? Oh, it was so embarrassing. I had a vision board, a vision board. Thank you guys. Yes, like a vision board. Okay, ready? I had the funniest intrusive thought like uh, two months ago, a month and a half ago, whenever it was, when I was in the heat of like feeling so exhausted from the nine to five stress of just immigration and moving and changing countries and everything, I had an intrusive thought that said, are you ready? If I only could do YouTube full time, my life would be easy. And then I was like, Brittany, you do do full time, like YouTube full time. What are you taught? You have absolutely no responsibilities except doing YouTube. I built a life that was my dream to be a full time YouTuber and only a YouTuber, not needing a second job. I worked three jobs my whole life so I could do YouTube full time. And I finally accomplished my goal. I now do YouTube completely full time. I never think about getting another job. This is my dedication. This is my job. This is my dopamine hit. I love this job. But I was so stressed last month because I wasn't being disciplined and I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't meditating enough that I actually had an intrusive thought that was so loud that literally thought, if only you could do YouTube full time for a living. And I was like, I do do YouTube full time for a living. What is going on with my brain? Stress is a killer. It kills the body. It kills the mind. And I let stress get the better of me. And that made me laugh so hard. And I was like, wow, wow. I've lost the plot. Like I lost the plot. I need to sleep. So that's definitely what we've been focusing on is sleeping because, oh my gosh, like I really need food, water, sleep. Those are the three things that keep me really stable in life. But I can't believe I had that thought. I was so stressed. I literally had this thought that was like, if only YouTube was my full-time job. It is your full-time job, girl. It's been your full-time job now for what, like two years. You haven't had to work. I haven't had to work another job since the start of the pandemic just about the start of the pandemic. Yeah, crazy. So a little longer than that. Isn't that so funny? Amazing. Just amazing. Mm. That sankalpa on a daily basis, that emotional energy will carry over through discipline. We don't have fMRI studies of people doing sankalpas and meditative techniques, but it is my firm belief that when you do this, you will be activating that positive emotional circuitry in every part of your brain. The last thing to think a little bit about is what are some of the things that get in the way of this? So I made one really interesting observation clinically, which is that people who are undisciplined are numb. And you may have sort of noticed this, that if you crave discipline, you're emotionally kind of numb, right? Like you really want this thing. You really want this thing. But every day kind of feels like a drab, gray, kind of like not super high highs, not super low lows, 
or maybe you're getting completely overwhelmed by emotion. And if we sort of think about the, the connection between being undisciplined and being numb, what's going on there is if discipline is an emotion and we're feeling numb all the time, we don't have the capacity to really cultivate or stoke that positive emotion. Mm. And so even though we use this numbness as a protection against negative emotions, because my life isn't going anywhere, I'm screwing up, I'm not going anywhere, or I'm just doing average, I can't really give it my all, and I want to mm. give it my all. And what, what do you do with those kind of thoughts and those emotions? You numb, and, numb them out. Sorry, if um, to, my, to my people who are like having a hard time journaling, I don't know if you guys do this, but I'm very like image based. So I have folders, like I said, like a vision board of like images of what I want. So if it helps, I have folders on my computer. I did this for my wedding where I had a folder on my computer of like wedding stuff and like what I wanted and what was the vision and what was the vibe. And I do that for life. I have it for even like OF where I'm like, what is my vision for OF? Like I have some art projects I want to do OF related. I'm really excited. Very goddess themed, very like ancient goddess themed shoots that I really want to do. I just love a space like OF for sex positivity and like expressing yourself in like obviously a nude fashion. I just posted some very like adult pictures for OF, like PS, obviously like 18 plus and like TMI, but like they came out really pretty, but like I'm naked, you know, you feel it's I'm naked. So, but it's gorge and I'm like so happy with it. And I make little vision boards for that too. Like I make little board, like <laughs> Anyways, I'm just saying if you want, keep a folder in your computer of all the imagery you'd like to bring into your vision of your life. You know, that seems to help me as well. You numb them out through technology, you numb them out through marijuana, you numb them out by just pushing them to the sides. But the problem is that when we numb our emotions out, we numb the positive stuff too, right? So if you th kind of think about it, you can't just numb your negative emotions. We can't just numb the anxiety and feel happiness and joy and love and excitement all the time. Either we feel everything or we feel nothing at all. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems with this technique that sometimes people run into is that they're alexithymic. So we've got a whole video about that. And some of these other aspects that relate to this sort of cultivation of positive emotion. So definitely check those videos out. My hope is that at the end of this video, you will have gained a new understanding on why you cannot be disciplined. Yes. And the core reason you can't be disciplined is because we don't really understand what it is. It's not willpower and it's not habit. It's actually emotion. Mm. But common. That's why. OK, that's why saying like just get it done because you have to. <sighs> do you, though? Do you really have to do anything? Because there's not really much you have to do. You only have to do it if you have the resolve to do it. Well, then you have to do it. But do you ever have to do anything without it being related to your values or your goals? And goals have to come from, like he said, a real place of resolve. They can't just come from your willpower to be like, I'm going to, there's a joy to be had here. There's like a link to your joy that I think goes missing in people that are just like, that's why you see, okay, it's why you see people get healthy habits that turn destructive, in my opinion. You'll see people who are like at the gym all the time and then they're, what would be their healthy outlet is actually really destructive for them. It's why you can't really know if somebody's at the gym and that means they're healthy because even though they're doing activity that traditionally might look healthy, are they being healthy about it? Same with therapists. I love therapy. I think therapy saved my life. And in some ways, like I know I've had bad therapists. I know you can get bad therapists and you might be addicted to the idea of going to therapy. So it might look like you're doing something good, but you might just be running away or you seek out a therapist that just validates your bad thoughts as well. Because like, oops, because like therapists are people and humans are going to human and people make mistakes. So it is kind of interesting, like the idea of in relation to your joy, you have to know why you're even seeking it out in the first place. Being healthy for healthy sake. Who? How? Who? Mm -mm. Neuroscience in the way that like sophisticated neuroscience gets buried by simple neuroscience gives us this idea that discipline actually isn't an emotion, but it absolutely is. And once you understand that, you have a whole new dimension to mm. actually work on cultivating your discipline. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. That was such a good video. Thank you. I think Discord recommended that video to me. Thank you so much for linking it. I vibe so hard with just like, again, what I've seen from Dr. K, I vibe so hard. I think there's something about him that is like pretty genuine. Um, you know, there's always like controversies around Dr. K, but I actually think it's just controversies when you're actually talking about 
existential dread in a real way and philosophy and mental health. I think there's like a messiness to it that is just the reality of life. You know what I mean? Not everybody is able to find their resolve. Not everybody gets a happy ending because it is not easy. So it's give yourself a little pat on the back here, a little gold star, if you will. If you're really getting better, even in the smallest of ways, because that's still a pretty big deal, right? Oh, that was so good. I am so glad we watched that. Oh my gosh, that was so good. Okay, so let's send you guys that link in the chat so you guys can know what we watched today. Linking it in chat. Thank you, Dr. K. Great video. Let's also like the video. Ooh, 17K likes already. There we go. Okay, very exciting. Wow, that was so good. In my head, in my bed, my belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Da, 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 da. 